Good morning. Uh, I'm Martin. Uh, I work at Project A. Project A is a venture capital firm here in Berlin that invests in digital business models. Uh, and unlike other VCs, uh, we not only give uh, our companies money, but we also help them. And I am there in a team that uh, tries to... Maybe it's a bit too loud, no? Is that okay? Okay, fantastic. That tries to um, help the portfolio companies uh, of us to become more data-driven, which means a lot of things from classic BI things, ad hoc analysis, building data warehouses, to uh, like more advanced things like machine learning and predictions. And, well, this is my fourth appearance at this lovely conference. Um, and today I, I chose to talk about this topic of how to help BI and AI people as a software engineer. So who in this room considers himself or herself as a software engineer? The majority. And who would say he or she is a CTO or a tech lead? Some. Very good, this talk is for you. Uh, so who would say he or she is working in analytics or BI? Some, you probably will, you will feel some of the pain. Uh, and who would say he's or she, uh, he or she is a data scientist or working in machine learning? Also some, nice. Um, here are my slides again, fantastic. Um, so uh, to, today I wanna talk about, um, well, some instances of where um, the collaboration between uh, software engineering teams and uh, BI or AI teams uh, is not as good as they could be. And this is something that I call uh, a collaboration gap. So it's a, it's a gap in a miscommunication of maybe also ignoring each other. And on the left, uh, ooh, yeah, you have, mm, let's say, a person that considers himself a BI or AI person. So these are people who try to uh, leverage the data of a company to um, improve the business. So they, they run analysis on them, they build models, they want to predict churn, they want to classify stuff, they, they want to, uh, well, run things so that they can improve the business with data. They are typically uh, not software developers. They usually have kind of very diverse backgrounds. They, so they cannot really code. What they often do is they run stuff in Excel or they manage to write some Python codes in Jupyter Notebooks. And, but often also they think they are good at coding. So, uh, so I think it has become a lot easier in the past years to, to run stuff. Well, and that's them. On the right side, you have the classic software developer. So they are concerned with building a robust and scalable uh, software platform uh, for the company. They want to do stuff right. So they want to write good code that lasts for years, that is unit tested uh, and, and works really, really well. They are usually also shielded from the rest of the organization behind some kind of scrum process. If you want, I can also just turn my laptop around because there's essentially only pictures. No? Okay. Um, yes, and well, the collaboration gap is in, uh, in the lack of communication between the two. So, um, IT persons think of these BI people as really, really weird. So they, they do really weird things that, um, um, well, are out of, best software engineering best practices. They uh, write horrible code. They, uh, ha they come with really weird requirements, which they often say, I need this and this technical solution, uh, rather than describing what their actual problem is. And typically, they are just right away ignored by IT people. And well, in the, um, let's say, analysts and, and data scientists, they well, they have to wait for, for months to get their, their DI ticket uh, at, uh, um, and to the next sprint. They, uh, they feel whenever they talk to software engineers, uh, everything immediately becomes very complex or even uh, complicated. And well, then they have the general feeling that everything they can do uh, without software engineering support 
uh, is, is a lot better. And so probably this picture looks uh, familiar to you in your company. So I've seen this uh, a lot. And well, and it leads to a kind of unnice situation that, um, uh, that then there are awkward workarounds around this problem. So first of all, there is a whole category of software out there that only exists with the, uh, with the label or with the, with the advertisement of no engineering support required. Right? So there is lots of things where people try to work around the, the lack of support from an IT organization to, uh, well, to, to be productive uh, and to do stuff. It leads also to, to the fact that uh, people who are actually should be making the company better with data then write software and they write it in a really bad way to, to overcome this limitation. It usually also leads to disastrous um, security setups where people um, run databases in the cloud without any kind of protection or only very limited. And well, and today I want to give some of my um, well opinionated uh, views on how how organizations can uh, solve this problem better uh, by, well, doing a few very simple things. Um, right, so it's, it's very easy to, to help there. Uh, so I myself consider myself a data engineer. The whole thing becomes, so lots of these problems are less of a problem when a company has a working data engineering team, although that's uh, very often not the case. Also, our recommendation in uh, setting up data teams is not to hire data engineers first, but analysts who kind of dig through data and try to improve the business. And also there's a general trend of um, tools for processing and analyzing data becoming available that need less and less data engineers. Right? So five years ago, if you wanted to do any kind of meaningful analysis, you had to have a big expensive data engineering team Nowadays, it's, this has become much more flexible, uh, but also leading to the situation that people who uh, are not good at writing software uh, run IT systems. Um, so the first thing where you can help is giving these people access to data. And that sounds simple, but I've seen very many companies where people just don't have access to the backend database. Uh, this is for reasons of then okay, we don't want that these people write queries on this database because uh, it might uh, slow down our production system or it's often before uh, data protection reasons or just because these people are ignored. And this is really bad because what then analysts and, or, or data scientists who want to build models or uh, do analysis do, they uh, share CSVs and database dumps on Dropbox. And this is not a situation that you want to have, that you have a kind of informal um, data sharing um, thing going on in your company. And so it's very easy and also not very um, uh, difficult to set up some kind of uh, access for everybody in the company who wants to have access uh, to the backend databases. Right? So if you are concerned with uh, people writing bad queries that kill your production database, then you can do it on a read replica of your production database, or you can have some kind of uh, BI mirror database where every night you dump the production database. If you are concerned with personal data, then you can leave these columns out. It's not so hard to have um, kind of depersonalized uh, data dumps. Um, uh, or you, you have some kind of other kind of system where you make the data available. Uh, if you do that, uh, please put, don't put your database on the internet. What often happens is that then this conflict of not having access to data leads to, well, escalates, and then somebody says, okay, please give these people access, and then all of a sudden the database is on the internet. Right? So I've seen really big production databases uh, accessible worldwide, sometimes even without SSL, uh, often with uh, shared passwords that fly around in some uh, Slack channels, and that is really, really bad. So I think at least three or four times a year I see databases where I can sniff the password because it's on the wire somewhere. Just happened actually again uh, yesterday. Uh, well, actually it was, it was on uh, Wednesday. Uh, sorry, on Tuesday. 
Um, so this is really, really bad. So make sure that the whole thing is secure. Uh, I always recommend to have at least two out of a VPN network, uh, out of IP restrictions, uh, or some kind of SSH tunnels. It's okay to force people to use SSH because this is usually a lot more personalized than uh, passwords. Um, if you then run some kind of um, microservices distributed architecture, then the whole thing becomes a lot more problematic. Um, uh, and then this, this challenge of having access to data is even um, uh, harder. I will talk later a bit more about it. Essentially, organizations like Zalando lost their ability to analyze what's going on on a broad scale when they do, did this introduction of this radical microservices uh, pattern. The next thing is uh, messy data. So whenever you see um, a kind of surveys, what is the biggest challenge for data scientists and machine learning people is that, that they say that the data I have is right away crap. And um, well, and this is often, or I'd say, I would say in most of the cases, the responsibility of IT people, right? So if you put your uh, all the the, the data about your business process in an unstructured MongoDB, uh, and then we don't care about um, what you write there, uh, then, um, well, then it's this kind of shit in, shit out problem. Uh, we're currently working with a um, horrible Oracle database that is 20 years old, where all the columns have three, uh, where all the tables have three letter table names, and everything is in German, and they occasionally uh, swap the meaning of columns uh, because uh, they didn't want to introduce new columns, and, and this is n not really nice. So, model your data. It's totally okay in the beginning to start with unstructured stuff for experimentation, but later apply schemas, apply um, unique constraints, apply foreign key constraints, uh, and so on. Also, there is so backend databases are there to support the transactional processing of the well, of what the business is doing. Um, but sometimes uh, you also want to analyze later what happened. And for example, if you have some kind of order processing uh, and the order was maybe initially uh, paid and later canceled, that um, what often happens is that old information in such entities is overwritten. But for, for analysts, it's very interesting when the order was canceled, when it was paid, and when it was refunded, and so on. So, in, in general, if you don't overwrite data or don't, over, or don't throw away information, that's also really helpful for, uh, uh, for, for these people. The next thing is uh, to, to allow people um, to, to write data somewhere. So, there is a lot of uh, BI tools, so mainly for, for visualization, for building dashboards on data that uh, directly a kind of access the databases, the data sources, and then directly show it in dashboards. And um, so this, people do this to avoid um, building data warehouses. So to uh, have some kind of database in between where you integrate all the data that you have in your company, clean it, and also integrate it across different domains. And um, so, but this is what people often try to avoid so where they have this direct connection between uh, front ends and uh, between reporting front ends and the data sources. And this is really bad because then they do lots of sophisticated tricks to, to get this working when they have then to join data or process. And often, uh, well, the solution is to have something where these people can write data to. So, for example, a database where um, analysts can uh, create tables and run them. Right, so you, you take, I've seen a lot of people doing crazy workarounds um, uh, around the fact that they don't have a database where they can write. And so, this is very easy to do. You basically set up uh, a database somewhere. It can be an RDS or a, a Google hosted Postgres. Uh, it can be also something else like a Redshift or whatever. But the, uh, if, you, if you give these people the way to write things, then um, yeah, they may make them really happy. And um, again, make sure that it's secure, that you don't... So I've seen, I've seen this kind of BI playground databases uh, unencrypted uh, on the internet without a peer restriction with all the company uh, data in there. That's also really bad. So it's your responsibility 
to, to help them with this, so to make it secure, uh, that, that can, they can play with that. The next is uh, the ability to run things, right? So if you have a, if you have a database where you, can run, where you can write things, then it's easy to write SQL scripts and Python scripts that, uh, uh, well, do something uh, in these databases. But uh, at some point, you maybe want to run these transformations or these scripts every night or every hour. And there's also lots of really weird workarounds uh, for that. But if you give these teams the possibility to just run Python scripts or shell scripts on some kind of machine, then you make them really productive. And this can be as easy as a, as a Jenkins instance or, or as a virtual machine on EC2 or on, on Google or Azure or whatever that runs a Jenkins or a Rundeck or, or something else, where ba basically people can, uh, without deploying things, run stuff. And yeah, so that's, uh, that's a thing that I always try to set up, some kind of um, playground uh, box where people can try stuff. Because if you don't do that, then they have to buy a kind of data science platform. Then they have to buy a huge thing that costs thousands of euros a year, where they can run Python scripts, right? And in the end, they want to run Python scripts. Um, so if, if you did this, then the next thing to, to worry about is to have some kind of back channel. So very often, uh, these, these, these BI or AI people do something useful. For example, they build models, so they, they build uh, health scores for customers or they build uh, likelihood of churn, or they build uh, quality scores for products and so on. And uh, so they sit on an immense trove uh, of, of really valuable data that you could use uh, also again in your backends. So you could do, do use that for personalization, you could use that for uh, syncing that with the CRM systems and so on. But uh, it sounds very obvious to to, to leverage the data that they produce also again in the back end, but it's, 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 it's typically not happening or happening very late in the stage of a company. And it's actually very easy. Uh, it, you need to provide an API where I can attach information uh, to a customer or where, where the BI team can upload information about a product and so on. Right? So it can be a simple API. Uh, sometimes we even just uh, gave data science teams the right access to the backend, where they just sync back some data and then there's some checks around it. But uh, so, uh, not having this kind of back channel of the data that these teams produce um, is not so uh, clever, in my opinion. Uh, next thing uh, is this kind of tendency in this space of uh, BI and AI to uh, use what I call hipster technologies, where uh, people confuse um, the process of making a company data-driven with buying a technology, or where people also uh, want to try new technologies. And then stupid things happen that, so I'm um, very often talking to people, they say, okay, hmm, we don't do any kind of, we don't, don't do anything with BI, um, what should we do? Um, and actually we thought about buying a data lake or we thought about uh, starting with a Hadoop cluster, right? And um, our recommendation is usually not to start with technology, but start with hiring people and then, um, well, letting them choose the technologies that they like. But also, uh, there is a tendency to, to do, um, well, to use stupid stuff that uh, is not really necessary and adds kind of crazy complexity. So most companies don't really need Hadoop clusters, or most companies don't have meaningful use cases for real-time requirements, or mo most companies don't really have terabytes of data that, uh, that justify uh, huge Spark clusters. Still, these people then say, okay, please uh, uh, install me a Spark cluster, and then they run really slow queries of them, where very simple things would often be faster and also much more easy to maintain and to um, uh, to, to monitor. So I think uh, by not kind of talking to these people and not uh, watching what they are doing, they do stupid things when it comes to technology choice. So I think it's the 
responsibilities of CTO to kind of watch what their uh, data teams are, are doing. One thing, though, that is one of these passwords that is worth thinking about is this concept of a data lake. So I see it um, as, as two things. One is if um, you have some kind of event collection infrastructure in place, it's basically the persistence of those events. So if you anyway have a distributed software stack where you have data in very many different silos, then it totally makes sense to think about some kind of event pass infrastructure where, um, well, where the, the systems that maintain and uh, have data produce events and send it somewhere. And, uh, well, and saving these events somewhere, which can be as easy as, as three buckets or, uh, or other blob storage things, um, that's super valuable. And the second thing, what people also often think about is if you have, if you want to make all the data of a company accessible for analysts, it can be also just uh, a kind of consolidated view on all the data sources of a company. So nightly database dumps or table dumps uh, somewhere in some blob storage so that people who want to access it uh, can, can do it. And uh, I wrote there the thing of lock everything. So this is what I'm always trying to convince uh, our CTOs in our portfolio to uh, do this strategic investment, which does not have an immediate um, business value of uh, basically uh, recording all relevant changes to the entities in the, in, the software, uh, in, in, in the platform. So each change to a product, to a customer, to a transaction, to, uh, to lock that. Also every interaction of a user with the platform and um, even if the, if the business questions that um, the BI and AI people might have in the future are not yet clear, right? So, so to not think, what do I want to do later uh, and what do I need to lock for it, but rather inverse and say, just lock everything so that I later can use that data to uh, do interesting things, right? So if you want to do machine learning, you need a lot of um, data and the earlier you start gathering that, the better. So I see this also as a responsibility for, for, for tech leaders uh, to, to set this thing up. Um, almost a last point. Um, so um, how do you kind of uh, uh, solve this problem in an organizational setup? There is the, the tragedy that uh, BI people usually uh, report to the CFO, or they report to the CMO, or other people that uh, are very far away from, um, well, from tech. Uh, and the same goes, well, and uh, tech people usually report to the CTO, and, uh, and that's not very good, and because, uh, well, then uh, people ignore each other, as we saw on the uh, first slide. And, um, well, first of all, my recommendation is to to have people, um, more than the tech organization, that uh, feel responsible for this. And it's easy if you have a dedicated data engineering team, for us, which is responsible uh, for solving all these uh, issues. But if not, then I see this as the responsible of a CTO. Right? In, in early stage companies or in companies where you don't need a fully fledged uh, data warehouse infrastructure yet, uh, um, the, um, the CTOs are, my point of view, responsible for helping the data teams to uh, have access to data, to model it, and to uh, become successful. Uh, so, and if not, so then it's my, my advice is to have some kind of uh, process where, um, right, so the, the problem is that typically the prioritization for a software engineering team is done by some kind of product people and they typically ignore everything that's coming from the marketing team and uh, the BI team. And the advice would be to kind of have some kind of sidetrack uh, in this process where uh, also things that come from uh, such a BI team uh, are prioritized. Okay, that's it from my point of view. Um, happy to answer your questions. Questions? Yeah, please. You mentioned that uh, transition to microservices makes it difficult to get a full picture. What are the 
solution? Yes, uh, so the question is um, that uh, I said that the transition to microservices makes it hard to get the whole picture, right? Uh, in some kind of monolithic uh, infrastructure, uh, basically BI teams query the backend database uh, and well, Walter also usually has some pains because they can become really big, but uh, that's okay. As soon as the um, uh, data sits in 15 different databases, uh, it, it's not nice. And uh, for example, um, when three years ago Zalando said, we don't allow other teams to look in the databases of other teams, lots of people in the BI teams quit because they said, it's not fun to talk to these, uh, um, to these web services to kind of, uh, well, query gigabytes of JSONs, uh, so we are not productive anymore. And, uh, or we have one company where the data warehouse team, the data engineering team, queries more than 15 different databases with all the uh, instability issues that are there. And, well, and if you have the, if you have these different microservices thing going on, then I think you need to think about some kind of event bus infrastructure where you reverse the, the flow of data, that you not say analytics and AI people query these databases, but where every team that is responsible for a certain business entity, like for a product or for a customer and so on, uh, announces every change of such an entity or every creation or deletion on uh, some kind of event bus, right? And this can be as simple as, that doesn't need to be a kind of a weird queuing system or a, a complicated Kafka infrastructure. It can be as simple as writing log files somewhere. Of course, then as soon as, as you do that, you also figure out that this might be also a good way of synchronizing data between different uh, departments. Uh, but so, but, um, so this is highly specific. So the, the buzzword is sometimes also enterprise service bus. At Zalando, it's called Nikadi, and yeah. So, but this is something that definitely the tech teams have to solve. They often, anyway, have to solve it uh, for for other reasons. But if they solve it, it also really helps um, data people. Next question. Okay, then thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>